Okay, so today our subject is intelligence in seven steps. And what we're going to look at are the um, different ways that we've defined intelligence um, from the past up to the present. Okay, number one, lay conceptions. What do we mean by lay? Um, lay is a word that we use to sometimes describe a normal person who doesn't have expert knowledge of a subject. So lay conceptions are the the ideas of people who didn't have uh, knowledge of a particular subject. Um, and here we're looking back maybe like 150 years ago, something like that. So in the middle of the 1800s. At this time, in the West, so we're thinking of Western Europe, perhaps the United States, areas like this, if you were quick, if you were eloquent, which means if you spoke well, or if you were scientifically clever, then you were considered by people to be intelligent. In other cultures, such as Asia, if you were obedient, which means if you did what people told you to do, if you were quiet, or if you could do things which seemed to be magical, if you had magical powers, then in these cultures you were considered to be intelligent. Now, later on, people started to look at this um, a bit more scientifically, and this began um, in the 1890s. And at this time, a Frenchman named Alfred Binet um, started the first standardized intelligence test. And he did this um, in the early 1900s. We studied it, I think, in 1899. And he was testing Parisian school children. And he was using heterogeneous items. So this was um, the time when we were first seeing standardized tests of intelligence. And these are the origins of the IQ test that we still know today. Um, Binet's work was um, built on by a man called Louis Terman. And he was working in California at Stanford University. And basically, he looked at Binet's tests um, in the 1920s and 1930s, and he revised them. He was trying to make them more accurate. And so uh, these are the two best-known figures in sort of the scientific... Um, anal analyst and testing of intelligence. Um, after this, um, there was quite a big breakthrough. And um, this involved looking at intelligence as not just one thing. So number three in our list is the pluralization of intelligence. Of course, by plural, we mean more than one. Uh, this is commonly called the theory of multiple intelligences. And the idea is that intelligence can't be defined just as being one thing. And humans um, are believed to be able to carry out analysis of uh, the world in at least eight different ways. And uh, let's just take a look at those. Okay, so we have linguistic intelligence. This involves reading, writing, speaking and the use of languages. Then we have logical mathematical intelligence. A scientist would be a good example of this and this can involve computing skills, uh, understanding patterns and relationships and the ability to solve problems using logic. Then we have musical intelligence. Um, composers of music uh, have musical intelligence and basically it means understanding and expressing yourself through music and rhythm and dance. Then we have spatial intelligence. An airline pilot would be a good example of someone who has spatial intelligence and this is about the visual perception of your environment and the ability to create and manipulate mental images. Okay, so those are the first four. Okay, then we have bodily kinesthetic intelligence. 
an athlete or a dancer would be a good example of this. And um, the key point of bodily kinesthetic intelligence is physical coordination and dexterity. The next one is interpersonal intelligence. A teacher might be a good example of this. Um, this involves understanding how to communicate with other people and how to work collaboratively. Intrapersonal, okay, the spelling is quite similar here, but um, an intrapersonal intelligence is quite different to interpersonal. And um, this involves understanding your inner world, what's going on inside you. And um, so this is understanding your emotions and your thoughts and having an ability to control them consciously. Finally, we have naturalist intelligence. Examples of this might be an anthropologist or a geologist. And this is somebody who has a good understanding and can interact with the natural environment. Okay, so these are the various types of um, identified multiple intelligences. Moving on, the next area that has helped us to understand intelligence is the notion of contextualization. And basically what this suggests is that we can't measure intelligence if we don't look at the context of the individual person. So an example of this we can imagine in the Amazon rainforest a tribe that has no contact with the outside world. Now the people living here may be the greatest footballers we have ever seen. They may have a great intelligence for playing football. However, because they don't live in an environment where football is played, they never learn how to play football. So in their context, this intelligence, this ability, doesn't have any reason to exist. So we're getting an understanding that intelligence is based on an interaction between a person and the opportunities they have for learning in their cultural context. And you can't separate these two. Okay, moving on to number five. We need to also consider the fact that intelligence is distributed. What do we mean by this? Well, intelligence is not something we can define as just being the ideas inside somebody's head. Intelligence doesn't just exist inside a human brain. Intelligence is a collective thing and it also exists in non-human resources. So books, computer files, and things like this that contain information, they're also part of intelligence. And another thing is other people, other individuals. So if we are in a classroom or at work, the other people that are around us may have specific knowledge or skills that we don't have and their intelligence is also part of the collective intelligence. So we maybe can do a particular job, they can do a different job, and together we build up intelligence. Okay, number six. Okay, intelligence isn't just a thing that exists. If we educate people and we nurture them, and by nurture I mean help to grow and develop, um, we can create intelligence or we can develop it and make it bigger and better. Now, this is something that's not understood very well at the moment, and this is one of the big challenges for the future of our understanding of intelligence. Okay, and finally, number seven, humanizing intelligence. Okay, so we're starting to understand now that intelligence doesn't make a person human. A human is comprised not only of intelligence, 
but also their motivations to complete something, uh, their personality, and their emotions. So, measuring somebody and judging them according to an intelligence test is not really fair. This is only one aspect of being a human. So, we're starting to see intelligence as being one part of the whole and not the most important thing. Okay, so those are the seven things that have uh, helped us to understand intelligence. Okay, this is the complete infographic of everything and this is also contained all this information is contained in input 2 of unit 1 so as you're reading that look at this and I hope this will give you a better understanding of the text um, you can get a copy of this infographic from your teacher too so that's it